Hi, my name is Anna Dice. I'm here at St. Thomas Aquinas Parish, and I'm joined by Deacon Thomas Hendrich. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for having me. Good, good. So I wanted to talk today um, a little bit about the topic of marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, before we get into that, I'd like to know a little bit about uh, your story, your background, who you are. Sure. Uh, I'm currently 56 years old. Um, I am a father of four, husband of one. Uh, my wife and I have been married 31 years, um, just recently. Um, I have uh, seven grandchildren. I found out literally this morning that the <laughs> seventh one is in utero uh, from uh, uh, my uh, son and his wife, and they, they were not expecting to have any children ever. They didn't think it was possible. So that's a glorious uh, uh, blessing to our family that uh, will be coming to fruition about, uh, what would that be, May? June, July, somewhere in there somewhere next year. Somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in northwest Iowa. Um, I was a very rural and a very farm-oriented uh, state to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a town of about 1,100 people. Um, I'm one of five kids to my parents. Um, my mom and dad were married in 1957, and they just celebrated 62 years of marriage um, wow. last awesome. week on the 26th. Um, and uh, they had five children, uh, and I'm the fourth of five. Okay. Um, grew up, uh, at the town was 1,100 people. My dad was a large animal veterinarian, and mom was a stay-at-home mom. She was also a uh, home economics teacher before that. Um, but um, uh, grew up uh, K-12, Catholic school. Um, I graduated from Briarcliff College, and now Briarcliff University in Sioux City, which is a Franciscan uh, university okay. with a bachelor's degree in psychology. I went to Texas Tech and got my master's in marriage and family therapy uh, there and then Iowa State for my PhD in uh, marriage and family therapy. Um, I met my wife uh, while I was at Iowa State. She was a recruiter for Iowa State. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and she had the northern half of the state that she traveled to recruit students. Um, but when I met her she was actually um, on campus and we met at daily mass, which everybody kind of rolls their eyes, I'm sure. <laughs> My wife currently is a theology teacher, and that's what her students do all the time. They just roll their eyes, of course, you'd meet your husband at mass. <laughs> um, but I think that's one of the greatest things, um, especially at the start of our, our relationship, uh, because it's not a requirement to go to daily mass. Mm -hmm. uh, but my uh, seeing her at daily mass told me a mountain of information about who she was and what she valued in her life without her saying a word. Uh, and I would suspect my presence there did the same, um, that I'm, you know, it was at noon, mm -hmm. um, and just giving up that time because the mass and faith is just that important. Um, and then we were introduced by a mutual friend there and things just progressed from there. Uh, very happily, I might add, so. That's awesome. Yeah. That is really cool. Yeah. So I didn't know she was a recruiter. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's very funny. Very <laughs> ironic. But mass, mass was the, the, mass was the thing that brought you together. You know, it really is. Um, daily mass has not been something, I'm not a daily communicant, um, but uh, try to get to mass as much as, as a person possibly can because the graces that come with the receiving not only of the Eucharist, which is the source and summit of our faith, mm -hmm. which is the greatest of the sacraments, um, outside of baptism, I suppose. Hmm. Not sure which one is the greater on that. <laughs> um, but uh, the reception of the sacraments is so important for the grace to flow in our lives. Frequent reception of those that we can, um, I think, is central to a very good, healthy life for an individual, but certainly uh, for a marriage as well. Uh, to have a marriage centered on, based on Christ as the rock of that, I don't think anything else makes sense, mm -hmm. if that's making sense to you. Yes, okay. yes, it totally does. Okay. Um, now, you said you have your, uh, you got your doctorate as well. Yes. You're practicing marriage and family therapy. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to counseling, I think there's all different kinds of counseling, specializations and whatnot. What is your passion? What do you like to, is there a particular group or demographic that you like to work with? There is. Um, th what brought me to the valley was Bishop Olmsted's uh, Into the Breach. 
uh, reading that, and I don't think I got more than a paragraph in, and recognizing this man is speaking to exactly what I felt. Men uh, do not understand what their real calling is, and we have lost, not just the men, but um, as a society, we've lost what our real call is as men, women, husbands, fathers, sons, and daughters. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that spoke to me, and that was a huge part of my wanting to come to the Valley, um, which has only been about four months now. Um, but um, the uh, uh, encyclical, not encyclical, the, uh, the uh, letter that was written by the bishop, Complete My Joy, mm -hmm. uh, was also a driving factor because we have so many people um, that do not understand anymore what marriage, family, being a Catholic family, a Catholic man, a Catholic woman, really means anymore. Uh, and Bishop Olmsted is spot on correct in uh, what he sees as the need for our uh, men, our women, and our, our families. Uh, and I wanted to be a part of it. So I started a uh, Catholic-based uh, practice, and I'm also involved with another Catholic-based uh, practice uh, uh, right now in the Valley. Um, there's a huge, huge need for really good, solid Catholic therapy. There are a lot of uh, very good practitioners out there, but we'll say a lot of things that are very anti-Catholic teaching. Mm -hmm. For myself, what I have learned, I've been doing this job, believe it or not, for, uh, let's see, 33 years, about 50,000 hours of time in the chair, one-on-one -on -one with families or individuals. Right. I particularly like talking to men. I like talking to uh, couples as well. But to get them educated and focused on the reality that the Catholic Church has it right. The Catholic Church has always had it right. There are a lot of different places out there, a lot of different voices that will say the Catholic Church is absolutely wrong. Uh, I can tell you that in every teaching I've found with the church yet, you will find, number one, an extremely good, rational, thought-out argument as to why this is correct, and I can't refute any of them ever. They might not be easy, but the reality of them being correct is spot on every single time. Um, one of the challenges I had when I was back in Iowa uh, was seeing so many couples that were coming in on their second, third, and fourth marriage. Um, and I started to see um, uh, same-sex couples coming in wanting help. And that provided a huge challenge for me. And I went to the bishop, and I, and I asked him, Bishop, how can I do my job and remain a faithful Catholic, and et cetera, et cetera? What, what should I do? Right. I was actually kind of looking for a job from him. Um, and the man looked at me, Bishop uh, Walker Nicholas, a wonderful, wonderful bishop, uh, said to me, I believe you're called to the diaconate. And I was not expecting to hear <laughs> that out of that conversation whatsoever. How did a counseling job become the accident? I have no idea. <laughs> but I can, I can still remember driving back to my office after that uh, visit. I can, the literal intersection where that lightning bolt finally did hit me. Part of my call to the diaconate was actually here in Arizona at the Grand Canyon. Um, a group of men from my church led by our pastor um, went on a retreat of a sort. And uh, we hiked down the Bright Angel Trail and on the North Kaibab out to Cottonwood uh, Campground. I don't know if I'm sure some of the people have yeah, been there, yeah. but it is gone from everywhere. There's, you know, nobody gets out there. Mm -hmm. And we were um, talking one night uh, about uh, you know, life and what would happen if our spouse would die was part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. That was a big part of why I did not um, look at the diaconate. It's like, I couldn't get remarried. And um, my thought, and many of the other men that were there, uh, comment was, well, I look at the priesthood. And I thought that to myself, and I, I, this is just the truth. It's a bit embarrassing, but it was in the outhouse at the bottom of the Grand Canyon <laughs> where God literally said, well, if you would become a priest, then why is that a hindrance to you whatsoever on the diaconate? Uh, and that was one of those, the bricks of that wall that just came down that day. And it was like, well, that's not a, a real issue then for me anymore, is it? Uh, if I'm willing to be celibate for the priesthood, why would there be an issue if, you know, my wife would uh, die in an untimely manner? Um, 
So that, that fell that day too. So it was a slow, long burn uh, for the diaconate. I thought about that probably for the better part of 20 years and came up with lots of excuses why I shouldn't. So I, I see my role in the diaconate very much as being someone that helps the fishers of men. The priests are the fishers of men. Mm -hmm. The bishop is the fisher of men. Um, I see myself as, uh, there's always an, an image with the, the story of the overflowing nets of my job is to help them while they're hauling in the fish. I keep the fish in the net. In essence, um, I've, I've felt very drawn to helping those Catholics that have always been here understand the faith that they've got, that has been a part of them for a long time that they didn't even know was there. Um, throughout um, my preparation to begin formation and formation itself, I read everything in sight, and I'm still amazed with how much there was there that I just didn't want to bother learning because I just didn't want to take the time. And I've got a great passion of teaching that to people. And I found that when I have taken the time to sit and talk with people, tell them about what their true dignity, their true worth is, what a marriage is really about, they tend to get very quiet and they tend to say things like, wow, that is just beautiful. That's amazing. That I never thought of it that way. Because we have uh, an ear now uh, to listen to society, mm -hmm. to listen to whatever Hollywood star is the current one with the loudest voice saying, I've got this opinion on such and such issue with absolutely nothing to back it up, with nothing whatsoever to back it up. Yeah. So... Um, my, one of my favorite is talking about, uh, well, my practice's name is Holy Family Therapy. Okay. Um, and uh, it's very much based on the two holy families. The greatest and most perfect is the Holy Trinity, where you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It is a perfect union of love. The Father, um, so self-forgettingly, loves his son, and the son so self-forgettingly loves the father that the love between them becomes alive, which is the Holy Spirit. And when I tell people that what I just described to them is a very short understanding of what human sexuality in the marital state is about, the husband loving the wife, the wife loving the husband, both un forgettingly holding nothing back, giving everything of themselves, who they really are. And then nine months later, that love takes on life, and they name that love their child's name. That's one of those moments when people go, oh, because they've never thought about it. They've never been told this is what true human sexuality is about. Mm -hmm. um, and then the church's teachings come from that. And then we have, of course, the uh, most perfect of human families that there ever has been, which is the Holy Family, Mary, Jesus, and Joseph. Um, the human component is there, too, and they are a great source and a great um, inspiration for us. One of the things that I really like about their story is the mm -hmm. flight into Egypt. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the joke that there is biblical proof that Jesus had a pet flea. Did you know that? So, in a, in a dream, Joseph is, is, um, has an angel come to him and says, take the mother baby and flee, and flee to Egypt. To Egypt. Uh, the jokes don't get any better. <laughs> Dad jokes, I love them. But um, that word flee is such an incredibly powerful one for our families today. Because what is associated with that one word? Fear, trepidation, uncertainty. Um, grab the child and run as fast as you can out the back door because they're coming in the front door to kill him. The most perfect family that has ever lived had all of those emotions and experiences as part of their existence. Um, and that was the best one that's been out there. All of us are going to have that same kind of experience. And it's okay. We're going to have fear. We're going to have uncertainty. We're not going to know what to do. We won't know everything that's coming. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's how do we live a life? What do we live that life based on with great faith? 
to address those issues, to um, follow and to solve those things as they come up in life. That's beautiful. It's a really beautiful um, story and image. Mm -hmm. uh, before, I definitely want to talk about some of the difficulties um, that we face, families face today, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in our society. Uh, but real quick, I wanted to know if there was anything in particular from the documents that you've mentioned, Complete My Joy or Into the Breach, um, any other points that you wanted to highlight the, in particular? The, I think the title Into the Breach um, itself was extraordinarily brilliant um, because what the bishop is talking about throughout the entire document is there is this gaping hole. If you think of a line um, um, in a battlefield, uh, the breach is where the break in the line is. And the bishop is calling for men to stand in that breach um, because our families are under attack. And they need us to stand there to be the protector, to be the leader, to be the, the stalwart guardian. Um, and that comes out in that document. And for men to understand that the company of good, solid men... Uh, in men's groups uh, that the bishop calls for specifically to understand that there's a brotherhood that is out there that can be of assistance and we can help one another. Um, we have uh, so few examples of that anymore. Um, you know, there's, there's a quote that I, I like myself, there's no shame in being wounded in battle. Um, the shame comes in desertion under fire. You know, we're, we're going to be beat up in battle, and, and frankly, um, our society is one that uh, men are now seen as buffoons and um, as the, the butt of jokes. Uh, fair enough, because we've got plenty of that anyway. Um, but we are not seen as those strong leaders anymore, and I think men are afraid to be uh, that. That does not equal um, being a brute or being domineering or being hyper-masculine to that extent, uh, the extent of saying, you know, it's got to be the man's way. I think it's probably one of the most greatly misunderstood um, uh, scripture passages. Um, I think it's Ephesians uh, 5.22. I'm not sure. Somewhere in there. Um, uh, men be the head of the family as Christ is the head of the church. Wives be submissive to your husbands and everything. Mm -hmm. um, the secular world will see that as men are here, women are here, and they dominate over women. And that is absolutely, completely, and totally wrong. And again, this is one of those areas where the church's teaching has been very clear for a long time. If I would ask anyone, if I ask you, mm -hmm. um, did Christ come to be served or to serve? He came to serve. Okay. So um, if Jesus is the head of the church... He is the servant of the church. So if I'm the head of the family, I am the servant of the, of family. the family. So my position is not here. My position is here, especially with my wife. I am her servant. That's how I am the head. And my job is, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? Please, what can I do for you today? Now, what is submissive then? This is actually a hard one I've found for women. Let your husband serve you. That tends to be hard. Most women kind of go, oh, I really like that. But then when the reality of doing that, it's, it's really difficult. You want to, a really, this, this is one for the, the people watching this video uh -huh. and you're married. Um, husbands, try washing your wife's feet. Simple task. Get warm water, get a bowl or a bucket or whatever, mm -hmm. and wash her feet. Um, it's an easy thing that will make her eyes roll into the back of her head. But I've also found that women have a hard time with letting that happen, to be served like that. Another really interesting one is washing your wife's hair. Simple task. Every woman I've ever met that it goes to uh, the salon to have her hair cut, styled, whatever, they get the hair washed and they always go, oh, I love love that. What I have found is men, I'd love to do that for you. Um, but the, the wives typically go, no, no, which is a real shame. That's, that's one of those areas that just is really heart-wrenching for me.
because what I have found is so many women will say things like, um, this isn't really about service to me. This is a backhanded, around the back door, something really for you. You really want something from me with this. It's not an act of service. And we need to honor that and recognize, because we have fed into the cultural norms of how things are done, that we have brought that on ourselves. Uh, but there's, those are acts of incredible intimacy between husband and wife that just can be demonstrated. Small little things that are there everywhere. The possibilities are everywhere to be that servant. Mm -hmm. And when you, you do it and you get hungry for it and do it more and more and more and more and more, and then to be a servant to one another, you won't need to come into my office. If people would just live that one thing, be the servant of the other, they would avoid my office. Yeah. So. And I'm just thinking in our Western culture, we so easily think of marriage and even relationships as a contract. Mm -hmm. You know, what am I getting out of this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then if it's a contract, it's something that can be terminated. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about, though, serving mm -hmm. and totally giving of yourself brings a whole different... Mm -hmm. It, it's just it completely changes the idea of marriage the idea of relationship mm -hmm. and unity mm -hmm. that it's not something that okay he could walk away from me mm -hmm. or that I've got to fulfill some kind of expectation and then I'm okay yeah with marriage we should be truly free I don't have to worry ever again about um, my wife leaving it's like uh, you know, I need to take care of myself. I need to be as healthy as I can. That's a gift. Um, but if you don't maintain a certain weight, if you don't maintain a certain look, et cetera, et cetera, then you're replaceable. That, again, is not that vision of that Trinitarian love that I, I mentioned before. Right. And I, I, I want to um, talk about that just a little bit more as well sure. because when I look at that in the human sense of human sexuality, the in, uh, uh, divisible part where we understand now biologically um, my wife gave her DNA, I gave my DNA, I gave everything that I was on a biological level and fused it together in an inseparable way. I cannot undo that with any of my children or any of my grandchildren. It is indissolvable. It cannot be undone. And you know, um, when you think about, I, I, I view marriage very much as a covenant. Um, I am now yours, you are mine. We are exchanging people when we get married. This is not contractual at all. Um, and the, uh, the image from Abraham, the, the covenant between God and he had the uh, smoking pot and the burning torch in between the split animals. Mm -hmm. Um, the imagery there is, uh, if I break this covenant, may I be ripped in two like these animals. And when we think of divorce, when that happens, and there are children involved, who is the one that's really getting ripped in two the most? And that's our children. Now, I understand that there are a lot of people out there that are divorced and that there are children involved. This is in no way a blaming or shaming of any kind. Um, I think it's the greatest gift that we can give to our children is to love our spouse in that self-giving, self-donating, selfless way for the sake of the kids as well. Um, and to have that as primary uh, in our focus and that as our primary attention. Because so often we, we don't do that. We just um, tend to think, well, this is all just going to be okay. It's all going to be fine. so powerful uh, to think of that when, when it when you make that shift and that mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. and it completely changes our whole outlook our whole dynamic yeah. how we approach things mm -hmm. well, yeah, I've been I've been holding this in my hand I was just and, gonna say you brought this into me I, I gave that to you <laughs> yes so um, and, and the people may have noticed I've been kind of holding it here because I didn't <laughs> want to put it down because it's so small um, this this is actually it's a little bottle of sand um, I think this is like five milliliters, I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, my wife uh, put, my wife and I put uh, together about 1,500 of, no, 
3,000 of these. I gave 1,500 away uh, when I gave a homily once. And I want to tell you the story about that because I believe it's really important that we as parents and um, as couples um, really focus on what the true goal and the true focus is. Um, frequently I'll talk to people about um, their spiritual life and, and what they believe in certain things. Um, and uh, oftentimes death will come up. And one of my favorite quotes, uh, as I told you earlier, is um, the only real tragedy in life is not to become a saint. Now, a saint is anyone that is in heaven. Uh, that does not mean canonized. Um, that's the, the mm -hmm. earthly process right. that goes on. But uh, to not be in heaven uh, is a true tragedy. To not have our children in heaven. My job as a father is to help get my children to heaven. That is the ultimate goal. Nothing else matters. And I talk to people about, well, what does, what does that mean, being in heaven? They always think of, well, that's being in happiness and being at peace. And that's all certainly great. And I ask, well, how long does that last? And they say, forever. I say, well, what does that mean? Well, it's forever. And then I tell them this story. Now, this comes from Father Larry Richards uh, from his book, uh, Be a Man. And I just loved it. Um, and he tells a story about, uh, imagine uh, wherever you are, um, that you've got a grain of sand on your shoe. Mm -hmm. And you, you have this little grain of sand on the tip of your finger. And your job becomes walking this one grain of sand to the top of Mount Everest. Now, every step that you take takes a really long time. So uh, every step is about 10,000 years on Earth. Okay? Okay. And... Um, you know, in, in my office, it's usually about five steps to just get out my door. Well, there's 50,000 years to get outside the practice. Is We're talking a quarter uh, you know, of a million years have already gone by. And you walk that to the top of Mount Everest. You put that single grain of sand down, and you turn around, and you walk back to my office at 10,000 years per step. And then your job becomes taking every grain of sand that is in my carpet, every grain of sand that is um, outside um, on the walkways, every grain of sand here in Arizona in all of the deserts, off of every lake, every sea, every river, mm -hmm. every ocean on the entire planet, one grain at a time, 10,000 years per step to the top of Mount Everest. When you get that entire job done, eternity just started. And we think of eternity and it's like, wow, that's really great about heaven. But people don't think about eternity and hell is exactly the same. That that kind of um, agony would be awful. Our only goal is uh, to be able to get to heaven. I told that story to a man once and he said, before I even think about taking that first step, my way through my life is gone. I said, yeah, it is. But we tend to think about everything on um, our earthly life as being everything, and it is not. It is only a small little piece of our life, a small little piece. Our real home is heaven. That's where God wants all of us. Uh, and he's begging for all of us to be there. Just come follow me. Be like me. Conform yourself to be like me. Archbishop Fulton Sheen talked about that a little bit when he um, was talking about what it's like for a person that is going to heaven versus hell. And the job of the Holy Spirit is to conform each of us to be like Christ in whatever fashion, certainly as an individual and then as um, uh, a family, as a, a marriage partnership. Um, and he, he saw, uh, uh, envisioned a soul that had not conformed himself to look like Christ in the afterlife looking for, for Jesus and looking Jesus squarely in the face and going, I don't see the family resemblance. 
And the sorrow of Jesus saying, I don't see the family resemblance either. I agree with you. And the person keeps going, looking for, and not seeing his family. Versus a person that has conformed their life to live like Christ, to be like Christ, who when they die, looks at Jesus and goes, there's my family right there. There it is. Yes, I belong with you. And then Jesus looking at that person and saying, yes, I see the family resemblance too. Come on in. See, Jesus does not force us to anything. He doesn't force us to be with him. We choose that or we don't. And then we are the living examples of that for our families here. We've, we've got to live a life with that in mind, which is why I have these. You know, that I, I, ha I encourage people to put this on your desk. And when you see it, just to be reminded of where is my ultimate goal? What am I working toward? What do I really want? And then live a life according to that. Um, you know, I, I gave away 1,500 of these when I did that homily. The grand total um, amount of sand that I, I used was about five pounds, maybe, maybe a little more than that, but about that, one little bag. And every time I step on a beach, my family rolls their eyes at the old man without, because I pick up a handful of sand and I just, you know, the, a beach that's going on for miles in every direction about what are we really playing with? We're like little kids playing with matches with our lives. Um, but to live a life devoted to know something greater and my children and my family is even greater. Now, applying that in our life, how do we live a life that is focused on that. Does that mean we are on our knees 24 seven? You know, we gotta have Gregorian chant playing in the background. No, we, we, we celebrate and we live this every moment of our day with what is in front of us. You know, uh, you know dinner time with the kids. By the way, a little secret on that. Do you know what kids really want? What? They wanna be important in their parents' life. That I'm your pick. That you carve time out for me. Not just going to the ball games and not the um, let's uh, get them involved in X, Y, and Z sport or activity, et cetera, et cetera. Those are fine too, in the right proportion and in the right amount. Um, but to really take the time to know me, to really know me, sitting around the dinner table talking about things that happened during the day and to listen with rapt attention to really say, you're important, I want to know everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, all of it. I wanna know all of that about you is so critically important. Um, and I think that gets lost in so many of our um, busyness of, that we have in our life, so. And it speaks to, I think, a belonging that we all desire. Mm -hmm. You know, even as adults, we want, mm -hmm. we want to know that we belong. Mm -hmm. you know, so that belonging in heaven of, mm -hmm. yeah, you're my family, mm -hmm. that recognition. Um, mm -hmm. Kids want that the same way. This is kind of the, the micro image mm -hmm. of what God wants. For Absolutely. Us. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, and we know how to do it. We know how to do it. Whenever I ask uh, a young man or young woman about the first date and who asked who out mm -hmm. and um, uh, things of that nature, um, there's always this great fear. I, I mean, I never was smooth with asking girls out. And my wife, when I asked her out for the first time, didn't remember who I was. It was like, this is not going well. But when that right girl says yes, um, the, the theme to Rocky tends to go off in guy's head. Dun, 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 dun. That's what it feels like. Oh, she said yes to me. Oh, this feels great. I am so lucky she said yes. And I've learned from women when I ask them, and the right guy asks them out, and they say yes, that uh, uh, music goes off as well, but it tends to be more love story kind of music. But the theme is the same. I'm so lucky. He asked me. I'm the lucky one here. And that first date, everybody's story is so similar of, I didn't care what movie we went to. I didn't care what we did. I didn't care what restaurant we went with. Whatever you want is fine with me because I'm the lucky one here. We know how to do it and to live that. 
all the time that I'm the lucky one. Unfortunately, what happens is that attitude within us individually changes. And we, we bite into the lie that, well, the truth isn't I'm the lucky one here. The truth is really you're lucky to be with me. That's the lie. The, the truth is we're lucky to have one another. You know, my job to be that servant of you and my great joy to be in service to you. That those, those joys just come out of us. And again, people understand that. I'll tell you another story. Um, I don't know if you, who you would have to dinner at your home, but you picture whomever that would be, sure. uh, some famous person, just don't make it family. You know, a lot of people will talk about, um, you know, some sports hero that is there's Tom Brady. Um, Patriots probably are not the best uh, team <laughs> here. But um, they, th and I, th we talk about, you know, getting ready for that person to come to dinner. And, you know, I'm going to make what they like, and I'm going to have what they want to drink, and I'm going to make the house shine. And, um, and looking during the time that the person's there for any small little sign uh, that they need something, and how quick we would jump to what can I get for you? How, what can I do for you? How can I serve you, right? And the joy that comes with having that attitude like that, um, that uh, they, they understand that that is just fabulous. I would love that. And I asked them, okay, now this dinner's done and it was perfect and um, uh, this person's very content. Would you say to that person, okay, now you get up, I'm sitting down, you serve me. We would never do that to anybody. That would be rude. Um, to remember that inside of a marriage, I am a servant forever. I am always the servant. Um, and, I, you know, when someone wants to serve me, I, okay, yes, I say yes. I mean, all the giving in the world does no good if it's not received. Right. Another, um, I'm married to an English teacher, theology teacher. Words mean things, and I'm reminded of that frequently. Ah. And um, <laughs> the Catholic Church, again, in its wisdom, has um, uh, changed the um, uh, marriage rite. I'm not sure if you knew this or not. The most recent marriage rite. Uh, when I put this ring on my finger with my wife, um, um, she said to me, take this ring as a sign of my love and fidelity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, that has been changed now to receive this ring as a sign of my love and fidelity. Now, people will, you know, the law is just parsing words. It's like, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, if I've got a gift that I've got for one of my nieces, nephews, or my children, grandchildren, and I'm really excited to give it to them, and they come running up from behind me, they grab it out of my hands, and they start opening it with reckless abandon, they just ripped it out of my hands, it's just got kind of a funny taste to it, doesn't it? Now, that's give and take. Mm -hmm. Now, if that same child comes up to me and is in front of me, and I say, I got this for you, and I want you to have it, I give it to them, they receive it, and they go and open it with that same reckless abandon. Everything changes. Marriage is give and receive. It is not, I'm going to give and then take for myself, thank you very much. It is not that. It is not that. It is give and receive. It's, I think it's something that's so easily forgotten. Mm -hmm. Again, as we said earlier about it being a contractual society. Mm -hmm. What am I mm -hmm. going to get out of this? Mm -hmm. uh, versus receiving mm -hmm. the other and re really recognizing the mm -hmm. other. You know, one of the things that um, I'm so, so grateful for, I was not at the time, mm -hmm. uh, Father Dan Nepper was the priest that um, witnessed my wife's and my marriage, and he insisted on us memorizing our marriage vows. Um, and I've done weddings, and people do not want to <laughs> memorize them at all. Um, but the... the um, grace of a holy and great marriage is encapsulated in them in a very practical way. I wish people could almost brand them on their eyeballs. Here, here are mine. I, Tom, take you, Cecilia, to be my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. The end. 
I didn't say the end. <laughs> um, you know, there was not one word in there at all about what my wife had to do. Not one. I just said what I'm going to do. I'm going to love you. I will honor you. I will cherish you. I will respect you in good and bad, sick and health, all the days of my life. That's it. And that's my job. But here's the thing. What if I'm successful? What if by the way I act and how I treat my wife, she feels loved. She feels honored. She feels cherished. She feels respected by me. Now, if I'm only doing it for a selfish reason, reason, which is a really bad thing to do, but if I was only doing it for selfish reasons, how would she be back to me? More like that or less like that? More like that. Yeah. Yeah. So even just for me, treat her nice and kind and loving and all of those things, that's only going to help me. That's on the worst level. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I'm doing that altruistically for someone else, because this is what I need to do, I've got to do this. I've got a hunger for this. And then if my wife has that same hunger back this way, again, you won't need to come in my office. And then if our kids see that being lived, what is the likelihood of them living that for their children and their wives and their spouses? And that's the greatness that we have because then it can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Yeah. So... Well, let's talk a little bit. I, I love all the stories that you've told and everything, and it, it's wonderful. Um, but I know there's times where we can say, all right, this is, this is wonderful, this is beautiful, this is what the church teaches, but this is not my life. Mm -hmm. And what do I do? Mm -hmm. How now am I in the middle of a mess or mm -hmm. whatever it may be? How do I live this? How do I... Um, the practicalities of it. Right. Oh, yeah. And I want to be very clear, there has not been all wine and roses for my wife and I. Um, I've only received the wine and roses, right? That's all <laughs> she's... Uh, the, the realities of that flea has been present in our life as well, where it's been very, very difficult at times, with very, very difficult situations. Um, it is the how we deal with those situations that are the things that make us great. My dissertation, by the way, was on long-term happily married couples. Uh, this had nothing to do whatsoever with spirituality, uh, but I can recognize it since then, where um, I talked to, all I did was talk to couples that have been married 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. How did you do it? How did you do it? And um, every one of them um, said two things. The first one was they were saying jokingly, um, they said, we never thought of divorce, we thought of a gun, but never divorce. <laughs> That's a literal quote from every single one of them. But all of them said in there, we had really, really hard times. But it was how we got through those hard times that made us great. And that has really stuck with me. That was you know, 30, uh, 38, no, 28 years ago that I did that dissertation. Um, and it is very, very true. I mean, and the myriad of ways that families struggle and the different things that we have, we usually turn to ourself um, and we tend to try and solve these things on our own, mm -hmm. usually with the best of intentions, um, instead of turning to our spouse. One of the big issues that is hitting our culture now is pornography. Uh, men with pornography as well, we are in a culture that says there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. That is an absolute and total, complete lie. Um, pornography is destroying our um, uh, families. It's destroying men. It's destroying relationships. It's destroying everything. But because it's so pervasive and everywhere, people just think it's okay. Um, but there's still that element of people know instinctually this is not okay. For example, um, if a man is looking at pornography on their laptop, as soon as somebody else comes in, boom, the first thing they do is close that. They close it um, because they don't want this to be seen. They, they, we know this is not correct. Um, to go to one's spouse and talk about, I've got this problem, is one of the hardest things in the world to do. 
but it tends to be like cockroaches. Um, whenever you flip the light on, what happens with the cockroaches? They scatter. scatter. They scatter. They run from the light. And we need to shine the light of truth on whatever issue that we have, pornography being a huge one. Um, and then it tends to just run. Um, that doesn't mean that's easily combated and easily dealt with. There are treatment programs. There are some wonderful um, uh, sites online. Reclaim is one that I can think of off the top of my head um, that can help with that. And there are addiction specialists, um, not nearly enough, um, to deal with uh, sexual um, pornographic addiction. I think it is far more common than um, alcohol and drugs combined to be quite honest, in America today. It is at that level uh, and needs to be addressed. But it needs to be addressed honestly. And you start with admitting that this is not right and I want it gone. Yeah. Uh, but turning to our um, first best natural helper, number one, which is God, through the sacrament of reconciliation and frequent reception of the sacraments, um, but then also the natural helpers that are in our life and who better than our spouse. Um, men especially, I don't think, understand how damaging pornograph or pornography is. Um, the, the heartache that I hear from women so, so much about, um, he doesn't want me. He wants that. I'm not that. I can't be that. I don't want to be that. But that's what he's really after. He doesn't want me. He wants, he wants something else. And their heart dies. And that's the real tragedy. Um, it's one of the reasons I like NFP so, so much that um, I don't think people understand this. And we're, we're getting better in terms of the education. But to, to propose to women, number one, you don't have to put chemicals in your body um, to be able to understand how your body functions and works and how you can um, work within the rhythms that mm -hmm. God put there and we can understand and know them very scientifically and extraordinarily effectively. Um, but it's more than that. It is really knowing the other person. There again, we're going back to the kids really want to be known. Um, wives really want to be, uh, you want, not you, the, they want to really be known by their husband. It's one of the things that used to upset my wife to no end. Um, she had some uh, physical issues later on that um, she had to have a hysterectomy, so it's not the same anymore. But when we were practicing NFP um, way back in the day, my youngest is 22, um, um, I would be able to tell within an hour of when her period would start because I knew her that well and it would make her so angry at times that's got nothing to do with what's going on and it was like and then an hour later she'd come back and go hey, you were right again <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would chuckle like that and get myself into so much trouble but it, but it was that element of knowing and again there is no saint here not not by a long shot i just want to be one and i want to keep striving toward that goal um but if husbands would have that goal of I really want to really know, love, cherish you. Women love cherish. To feel cherished by their husband, oh. For the men, the thing they want is to be, I want you to desire me. And frequently it is, I want you to desire me as much as you do the children. I want to be that kind of priority in your life. I'm a big believer. A lot of uh, people, especially moms, will get mad at me with what I'm about to say. <laughs> but marriage and family is never a competition. Okay, It's like the sacraments. The sacraments can never be at odds with one another. They have to be aligned. The same with marriage and family. Um, I am a huge believer in marriage first, family second, personal time third, career fourth. Um, and um, I've had a lot of moms yell at me, no, the kids need to come first. And I'm not talking about the practicalities of we've got to feed them, we've got to take care of their needs, and yada, mm -hmm. yada. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about 
in our heart, in our soul, what is our number one priority? Excuse me. Because so oftentimes we lose sight of that. And um, men feel, well, all I was needed was to help make children. That's what my, that's all that you wanted me for. And that's a real loss that they feel that they won't say. Men will not share a lot of these kind of things. These are the things that I've learned from them um, that they feel just very cast off and, and second. Um, now, the practicalities of how do you put one another first. I, I think of a time in my life, because the best thing I've got is my own story, sure. um, that my wife and I were going to um, a state speech competition for our son, and it was a two-and-a-half-hour drive, and he was performing, I think, at like 9 o'clock in the morning. So it was a Saturday morning. We get up at 6 o'clock. We drive two-and-a-half hours, find where he's at, find where he is, see him perform for five minutes, find him afterwards, find out, get his rating, get something to eat, blah, 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 and we go home. We don't get home until about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, is that marriage first or is that family first? A lot of people will talk about, well, that's family first. That's actually marriage first. Because my wife and I, um, several things with that. Um, number one, we decided this is the time in our life when we get to put the kids in that position where we're going to attend their things. We are going to be doing this. We're going to be sacrificing. But the we is there first. We're going to do this. And on the drive over, she and I are talking about the different things, what is going on with us. Our daughter was asleep in the back, um, you know, laughing and joking about different things, what's going on with different kids' events that are coming up, et cetera, et cetera. That was very much a marriage first moment. Um, and, you know, we do four things for our number one priority in life. The first thing we'll do is we'll sacrifice for our number one priority. The second thing is we will give, our, um, we'll carve special time out for our number one priority. Third, we'll give our best energy to it. And fourth, we will um, uh, give our best attitude toward that. Mm. And oftentimes, um, something is not necessarily bad in and of itself. Um, it's just in the wrong place of priority. Stopping doing something I shouldn't be doing to begin with is not sacrifice. I should not be doing it to begin with. <laughs> right. You know, to sacrifice, I, I lay down a legitimately good thing lovingly for someone else. That's what sacrifice is. Um, but that, that word attitude is so, so critically important in terms of how and why I do what I do. So if I would say to my wife, you know, fine. You know, I'm not golfing. I'm sacrificing golf for you. Uh, we're going to go to this movie that you want. You know, we carved the time out. Um, I took a nap. I'm well rested. Are you, are you happy now? Are you happy? Well, with that kind of an attitude, why bother? Right. You know, the, it's got to be, and, the, and again, this is a change of the individual. What do I need to change about me? Not what does the other person need to change? That's true probably as well. Um, most times when people come in and they've got a litany and a list of this person's got to change this and da-da-da-da-da, it's like, fair enough. They're almost always right. Mm -hmm. But are they listening to the list the other person has toward them with that equal sense of, wow, they're right about that about me, and I need to change that about me lovingly as a gift to the other. Um, whatever those are. And, you know, the people that are listening to this, that's one that they need to really wrestle with in themselves. And confession is a great place to start to really take a look at the examination of conscience about what am I really doing? How am I really living my life? What are those um, truest first priorities that show it? Not to what do I say, but what do I do? And how do I really need to change they take a really hard look at that and then start that process, they're onto a path of greatness again that um, very few people get to, I find. Okay, so you have brought up a lot about attitude, mm -hmm. and I think that's really important um, and kind of ties into our next piece of going back to the idea of 
handling different issues, mm -hmm. um, pornography, for example, going back to that. Mm -hmm. And okay, the husband does come and say, yes, I do have this problem. I'm struggling with this. How does a wife respond? Mm -hmm. Or even if it's vice versa with another issue, like how do you respond mm -hmm. with that? With one caveat, um, I would say the response is going to be the response that she has, so long as it's not violent. Um, you know, violence towards another person is never a good thing. Mm -hmm. But so oftentimes, uh, the wives are just feel such an unbelievable sense of betrayal, um, a violation of their wedding vows and their commitment, and um, just a sense they they almost take it on themselves. What's wrong with me? How am I not enough? How have I somehow failed? And I'm going to tell the wives very specifically, no, you didn't. This is an issue on his part. I don't know what it is or what's going on. There could be a lot of different things. But each of us makes our own choice. Um, so it is not necessarily something there. There are things probably that the couple needs to change, uh, like all couples do. Um, but if it's at all possible um, to reach out to your husband in that loving sense, maybe mad as heck, and maybe angry, but I still love you, and I will help you, and we can move forward, that is saintly. That is saintly, and that, that would be the best response that I could possibly suggest to, to see that you're, hopefully, your best friend is coming to you, recognizing I've got a problem and I need help, and to reach back in that same way. In, in the same way, again, if you think of it as if you would go to your husband, I've got this problem, how would you want him to respond back? Not condoning the problem, but how do we lovingly address it together? Pornography tends to be one of those that is um, a real knife to the heart. Um, and again, so much of our society is saying it's perfectly fine, it's perfectly okay. You know what's really interesting? The problem that we have with ED in our culture now, you hear Cialis, you hear Viagra, all these other things, mm -hmm. they are directly related to internet pornography. They are, they are a result of internet pornography. This was not as a big of an issue before pornography. Online porn creates ED. <laughs> now, what, what, when I talk to most men about that, they go, well, I don't want that. It's like, good. <laughs> yeah. That's great. But it is related. Now, again, a lot of the secular world would say, no, that's not correct. Well, I'm telling you, it was the secular world that told me. Again, it is just that violation of uh, such a wonderful bond that is between husband and wife and the fusing and that coming together that is just spectacular. But if there is a problem, having the courage to really address it, number one, in yourself, um, going and talking to your priest is something I cannot recommend highly enough. We don't make enough of the use, uh, use of the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Um, and then taking those courageous steps, potentially going to treatment, um, and just owning up to very humbly, this is an issue that I have, and I don't want it anymore. I don't want it. Yeah. So, and I, that takes a lot of uh, courage um, to do that. Well, another and one that we're dealing with today is infidelity. There is a ton of infidelity, and it starts almost invariably quite innocuously, very simply. Um, uh, it was roughly 10 years ago, I think I heard the statistic back then, one out of five divorces mentioned Facebook specifically in what caused the divorce. Hmm. And it was, it was, well, I just wonder what so-and-so from high school has been doing. I wonder what they were up to these days. I wonder what my old girlfriend, my old boyfriend's been doing. And everybody has uh, their own Facebook page. You know, I've got mine, and my wife's got hers, and da-da-da-da-da. And uh, we hide these things from one another. Again, like those cockroaches with the lights off. You know, I can have these things, and, you know, it's not doing anyone any harm. Well, that's the lie again. Um, and at some point, I just found out, you know, we've been talking back and forth and et cetera, et cetera, uh, with my old classmate. But over the course of months, years, 
all of a sudden it just becomes more and more and more. And people think, I can have this without her even knowing. Without him even knowing. And um, it's almost when, when people come in to my office when they made that appointment, it's who had an affair on who with some kind of social media. That is one that is, again, of epidemic proportions. The solution that I have found that is um, quite simple, um, and I do practice it, my wife does not have her own Facebook account, and neither do I. We have one shared together. Um, um, now, there's nothing wrong with Twitter and all those other things. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things that are very wrong. Uh, Tinder, for example, is one that is very wrong. That is only about people hooking up for sex. That's it. That is its whole function. Um, it speaks to that I want to really be loved, that we all have that great yearning, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm supposed to have with this person um, that I'm married to, but I need to give that. And that, that, that great knowing, that great lovingness can be satisfied there. But we're looking for it in all these other places. Um, the um, um, uh, number of people that are out there having affairs is, is just sad. It is just sad. And again, people are thinking there's nothing wrong with this. So, um, you know, I can be doing this too. Um, and again, that's that lie that is being spread right now, um, that it's okay, the church has it wrong. Um, you know, the church talks about the indissolvability of marriage. Infidelity is not um, grounds for an annulment. Um, it's one of the things that I, I don't believe people understand about annulments. Annulments look at the moment of getting married in the exchange of vows. Was there something in the way at that exact moment? Anything that happens after that, if it has its roots before that, the church can look at that. Um, but um, in and of itself, that's that better or worse part that we talk about, that indissolvability. That's a hard one for people to recognize, a very hard one. Um, I, I uh, talked to a lot of women, unfortunately, that were standing in the back of the church. And there was, there was one um, uh, person in particular that just said, Dad, I don't want to get married today. I don't want to get married today. He said, you're getting married today. Mm. That's it. You're going through with this. And, I mean, we've spent all this money. We this, we that. Now, did she freely give herself to her husband at the exchange of vows right then? Um, or, you know, the pregnancy before marriage and just out of plain fear, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some people will, will say and uh, do things just, I, I've got to do this because I've got to deal with this. When are they really fully giving? And that's what the tribunal looks at. Was there something going on prior to and up to the moment of, um, of uh, the consent to vows, uh, consent to marriage, um, that kept the sacrament from happening? where it didn't happen. In essence, we did not get married. Legally, certainly. The mm -hmm. children are certainly legitimate. There's nothing about that at all. This is all about the sacrament at that moment. Um, and that's something I don't think people understand. Mm -hmm. um, because again, we're biting into the secular world of um, what we believe marriage is. Right, so. right. And again, it comes back to that, um, the sacramental bond, which is a covenant, mm -hmm. which is so different from a contract. The mm -hmm. The giving of ourselves, not a service, not, well, as long as we're happy. But I give mm -hmm. my whole self to you and receive mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, that that's, again, that really changes it mm -hmm. to see from that moment. And again, those are the teachings um, of the, the church. One of the, um, the quotes that I, that I love to um, share with people and people are amazed to learn that this um, wisdom is 1,600 years old from St. John Chrysostom, um, who wrote a lot on marriage and family life. And again, this is one of those, those little nuggets that has been laying there for 16 centuries that we just, or I for myself, 
just didn't bother to see and pick up. But I think it, it speaks so wonderfully as to um, what the marriage state is and what men specifically can do. This is from a non-married man, and he nails it. This is a quote from him. He, Young men should say to their wives, I have taken you in my arms, and I love you, and I prefer you to my life itself. For the present life is nothing, and my most ardent dream is to spend it with you in such a way that we may be assured of not being separated in the life reserved for us. I place your love above all things, and nothing would be more bitter or painful to me than to be of a different mind than you. Mm. And if we live a life with that as our focus, in the front of our brain, not as an afterthought, but I live a life that is larger than me, a life that is focused on the other like that. Now, we, if we get that philosophically in our head, now, the issue of pornography when it comes up, well, what do, we, what do I do with that? That doesn't fit. Pornography doesn't fit that. Um, selfishness does not fit that. Um, self-centeredness does not fit that. Other-centeredness does very, very well. So, but I, I, that's one of my favorite. That's quotes. a really beautiful one. Um, I just want to touch on real quick. So we've we've talked about pornography and how that mm -hmm. is damaged marriage, mm -hmm. and how harmful that can be, and that in infidelity, Facebook has specifically mm -hmm. been named, and mm -hmm. so kind of. And just the ideas of our society being contractual and mm -hmm. it, it's just so pervasive and society doesn't see these things as wrong mm -hmm. at all um, or harmful. How do you talk with kids? How, how would you, you know, as recommend as parents, you know, it's one thing just for the parents themselves mm -hmm. as a couple mm -hmm. to be working on these things and working through this. Mm -hmm. But society is telling our children as well, mm -hmm. you know, telling our kids that these things are fine mm -hmm. and that they're even good. It's go ahead, enjoy mm -hmm. this. This mm -hmm. is this is what you do. Well, there's, there's a couple of different schools of thought on that, and I'm not sure exactly where I land just yet. Um, the computer age is such now that um, it's not going away. Social media is not going away. Um, so we can deny our kids access to it, which has a whole different set of problems because that's how their classmates, et cetera, are communicating with one right. another and um, it's how information is traveling. But then when do we let them have it? Um, my kids were at an age where it was just starting, so it was very much in the high school years. Now, I mean, you know, that tall are having devices. What I will say is um, the kids get addicted to it like that. Um, I'm thinking of my own grandchildren. Um, the oldest is six, the youngest is months. But when these devices are out, um, they go to them immediately. They gravitate toward them instantly. They want to be holding with them, they want to be playing with them. They will become addicted to them very, very quickly. I do recommend uh, not letting them have their own devices and if there is ever a question of you give me the device right now and I will be looking through it and I will have all the passwords and I will have complete access and if that's not um, acceptable then you will not have the device. Um, a lot of parents will say well that's just not practical and you, they get a lot of I hate use from the kids and etc. Um, but I think um, being very good guides for our kids in how to deal with these media. Um, in fact, I'm going to not have this on me anymore because I don't <laughs> like it anywhere near me. Um, there are subtle messages that come with that. When we have a phone in our hand constantly, we're saying what the most important thing is in our life, aren't we? You know, or when I say, well, just a minute, I'm going to check this. Not this person. I'm saying the device, it's far, far too powerful. Um, they are very powerful tools, and everybody's got one, and everybody wants them. But we have to be the guide to show our kids the right use of any tool. These are like loaded guns in our children's hands, and they do far more damage. 
um, because what the kids can find on there that they can stumble across, that they can um, have from one another. Um, I would have the parents do a lot of education on their own on what different memes mean and the uh, acronyms that the kids are coming up with to describe things, um, you know, just with the letters, or you will be appalled at to find out what some of these things mean. Um, and again, it's done very blindly. The parents' intent is not to turn a blind eye, but we need to stay on top of and educated as to what's out there, and it needs to be an open... Um, um, network, if you will, inside the home where the parents have control of all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they need to guide it and they need to regulate it and uh, withdraw it. Uh, I do, well, kids will not sleep as well at night if they've got screens on constantly. Um, two hours before bedtime should be all screens off. That includes television. The kids will sleep better. Now, most parents are probably going, oh. That's what I used to put my kids to sleep. <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. Um, you know, when my now 30-year-old son was in high school, so 14 years ago, um, he was telling me about um, his friends that would have the phone in their hand and it would vibrate, so it would wake them up in the middle of the night so they wouldn't miss anything. We're not missing anything. The, all of that is just fill-in-the-blank garbage. We don't understand the value in silence and the value in being unplugged and we need to get that back so I'm a very large advocate for restrictions on um, social media um, not letting kids uh, have access to it um, just at will and it be extraordinarily highly monitored okay uh, this kind of brings up another question too is uh, discipline. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think it's hard uh, to transition from whenever mm -hmm. a child is younger. Mm -hmm. um, a reward system, system can work really well, mm -hmm. but as a child gets older, uh, it can be helpful, beneficial to switch and uh, shift into something a little bit different and mm -hmm. not just punishment reward. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you recommend maybe a, a adjusting um, to that shift. You know, I think it's really incredible God's plan that it takes men and women to create children. It takes men and women to raise children. Um, and again, the scientific world, the secular world is starting to show us some new things where the moms they're finding are the better primary parent from the ages of zero to about 12. And from the ages of 12 to 18, the fathers are the better primary parent. And that's always kind of fascinated me. Um, moms, you guys are so superior to us, it's insane. <laughs> um, because women um, can see so many different angles and uh, facets of a situation. You guys pick on more um, tones of voice than men do. We just don't hear them. Um, but you can see how the different pieces play with one another. Where men are more black, white, yes, no, good, bad, off, on. Okay. The kids need that um, multifaceted up until about 11 or 12. But then they, it kind of shifts at that point where it needs to be more yes, no, good, bad, black, white, off, on. Um, and it, it takes that dad to step in a little bit more. And that's a really hard one for them to do to be, you're the primary. Not like, I'm going to wait till your dad gets home and then you're really going to get it. No, 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 no. Nothing like that at all. Um, but that guiding hand that only a father can do um, in his own unique way. And that father specifically to those children specifically, there's no replacing that. And again, that involvement all the way through. Um, and the, the disrespect that we see so much of our children towards their mothers. And whereas dad, you know, my dad was extraordinarily clear um, with my brother and my three sisters that um, there would be um, consequences on biblical proportions if we ever disrespected um, his mom. He said, I, I cannot make you respect your mother, but I will absolutely make sure you respect my wife. Um, and I'll treat you like any other person that disrespects my wife. And we knew it, and it was never an issue. Um, 
But we allow children to get away with far too much. And we go, well, you know, they're just growing. Well, of course they're growing. But um, they need to truly grow. Uh, a lot of people will tell me, spare the rod, spoil the child. Correct? Now, it's probably one of the most misrepresented um, scripture passages as well. Um, the rod is referring to the shepherd's crook. Okay? Um, and it was, they would put the crook by the side of the sheep's head to guide it in the right direction. Sparing the rod was sparing guidance. Mm -hmm. So if I spare guidance, I'm going to spoil my child? I agree with that. The kids need to be guided. That's the parent's job. Guide them all the way through. Don't just show up, you know, when trouble starts happening, when you're spending time with them, all of uh, the available time we can, doing projects, them getting to know you. Father Michael Schmitz does a video on that, talking about why does God the Father want to work with us through prayer. And he talks about his dad building a shed and, you know, having the kids help him with this. Because they learn more about the Father then. They learn how the dad works. They learn more about him and how I should be in life. Uh, ultimately, to be converted more towards God the Father. Mm -hmm. um, so spending that time with our kids all the way through, you know, um, and then, you know, when kids step out of line, what I'm finding today is parents just give to them anyway because I don't want to deal with the no. Um, I'm a huge believer in, I've, I've, I've found parents want to give their kids with both hands. I want to give with both hands. Um, and I think that's great. If that's the case, don't spoil because mm -hmm. you don't want to go too far. Um, but when the kids are not behaving like a member of the family, why are they getting like a member of the family? I've never understood that. Um, so to withdraw the positives, to withdraw those things, I think is great. And to, for the kids to understand why. Um, but we let the kids be more in control than the parents are in control today. And again, this is not anything you know like this. It's a very loving um, thing. I'm not a fan of corporal punishment um, because I don't think it's as effective as other things. For example, if you tell any teenager, you get to choose your punishment. Um, you're going to get five swats or I'm going to take your cell phone for five days. Which one do you think the kid's going to choose? They choose the SWATs because yeah. it's over with. Right. You know, the other one has more teeth. Um, but the dealing with the <laughs> teenager <laughs> without a cell phone for five days, the parents are usually the ones that are saying, I don't want to deal with that. Well, there's that sacrifice again and that uh, doing the hard things for the right reasons come in. But in, in terms of the kids, you, a, a child is not the same as a teenager. You're going to have to adapt um, and, and become. But our kids really, really want to do things to earn our praise, our admiration, and um, those attaboys, if you will. That mm -hmm. they'll, they'll do anything to get that from our parents, from their parents. Just that I'm important to you. That's what they really want. So give them the opportunities to shine. That It's the preemptive discipline, if you will. Give them areas where they can really stand up and say, wow, I'm proud of you for this. That, I think, is uh, one of the greatest things we have. So. And just as I'm hearing you talking mm -hmm. here, the more, um, you know, that you're, you're, you know, showing those attitudes, uh, you know, it's attitudes are caught, not taught, as, mm -hmm. they say, as the saying goes. Um, but also just in terms of parents being the primary educators for the children when it comes to faith mm -hmm. and raising children of faith. Mm -hmm. Research studies now are showing that kids are making decisions about whether or not they believe in God at younger mm -hmm. and younger ages, 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point, they're making the decision for their lives of how they're going to live that out mm -hmm. in their 20s. And that's mm -hmm. at that point. Um, so just it sounds so natural in a way of just being involved with them, of giving that attention. Mm -hmm. um, and then those are also opportunities to image God the Father, that that mm -hmm. helps mm -hmm. um, in mm -hmm. that. Do you have any other specific um, or things that you, uh, like in terms of evangelizing children and helping them? 
get to know, sharing Christ with them? Well, um, one of the, the, the best ways when you were mentioning this um, about the, the parents being the primary educator of the kids in the faith, that is absolutely correct, and I stand by that. And in every baptism class that I do, I reinforce that with the parents um, because I do a lot of the baptisms now with the deacon. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, you and your wife will be the primary teachers of your child in the faith. It's not the church and it's not the school uh, that are the teachers of the faith. It's the parents. So number one, know the faith yourself. Educate yourself. And if there's something that mm -hmm. you don't know, ask. There are resources out there that will um, uh, help you with that. Um, but to in the baptism rite, to take the time to reinforce with everybody there. I'm thinking of this one little girl. One of the, one of the, the um, dominant understandings or beliefs that people have is when we die, we become an angel. And it's like, <laughs> no, no, we do not become an angel. Angels are angels. Humans are humans. We do not become angels. Um, this little girl was really saddened by that. But I, I reinforce with the, the people during the baptisms because a lot of people that haven't been churched in a while are there. We talk about what the person's real identity is going to be after they're baptized. And at the end of the baptism, they are anointed as a priest, a prophet, and a king. I am now a part of God's family we are elevated past the angels. And I asked this little girl, so what do they call the daughter of a king? And she said, A princess. A princess. That is who you are. And that's when she beams. Mm -hmm. You know, that is who you are. Not anything else that anybody else tells you. Not this nonsensical name calling that we do in our society. Your reality is you're the daughter of a king. And to live a life where you are treated that way and you treat others that way. And it's all about the king, you know, and sitting on that throne with the king. Oh, so do I get a tiara? I said, yeah. <laughs> but to, to, to recognize and focus, again, like that little grain of sand, what is the reality out there? Not this, what does it look like? Um, so to practically put that in front of our eyes more and more and more. I'm not sure if that got to your question or not. No, I think it, I think it got to that. So. Okay. Yeah. And one uh, last thing, uh, what would you say to single parents? Because sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, divorce is real. We've been talking about this again, the ideal, the family. Mm -hmm. And even in some of these issues that mm -hmm. we've discussed, there's still an assumption of both husband and wife are there trying mm -hmm. to work through it. Mm -hmm. What if, okay, it's already done. Mm -hmm. It's already, divorce has already happened, or mm -hmm. I'm even trying, but my spouse has left, has mm -hmm. remarried, whatever mm -hmm. the situation may be. Mm -hmm. What would you say to single parents? Number one, I would say the church loves you and the church wants you and you belong, you belong in the church. Do not, if, if there's ever any feeling of the church is discarding you, um, come and talk to someone again because we, we want you here. You belong here. This is the refuge for you. That's the, the, uh, the church is not a museum for saints. It is a hospital for sinners, starting with me. None of us has it perfectly. Um, and there are a lot of single parents out there doing their very level best and I have nothing but admiration for them to continue to do their best and to keep um, looking for the resources you need in the specific areas of your life where um, we can assist and we can help. Um, but this is the place that we really, really want to be. Um, again, the church has it figured out. Um, this is a little bit off topic, but you know, my, when my parents celebrated their 60th um, wedding anniversary, mm -hmm. um, I was given the, the wonderful privilege of preaching the homily there. And, um, you know, I asked, um, this was Holy Spirit moment because it was not part of what I had prepared, <laughs> but I asked everybody present, 
Um, you know, if you've been married 25 years or more, stand up, would you please? And a third of the place stood up. Mm. And I, I asked them, where else are you going to see something like this? If you go to a rock concert and I say, whoever's married 25 years, stand up, would a third of the people stand up? Or a movie theater? Or a football game? Et cetera, et cetera. You'll only find that in the church. You'll only find it there. That is the, the rock bed, not just of that issue, but of goodness, of wholeness, of holiness, of living a life greater than something that is just of this world. For every one of us, it's going to be in the church. Mm. Every one of us. That's where the answer is. Don't give up on that, but turn to it. And if it feels like the church is turning against you on that, and I've heard that it can't happen, Take a breath and try again. It might need to be in a different space or with a different person in that same uh, space. Try again. Don't give up. This is where you belong. Mm -hmm. You belong here. Yeah, that's, and I, that's, you know, um, with our baptisms, that's what's happening. We're inserted into the same body. This is where you belong. Yeah. And I think it, with some of these issues, you know, it comes back to, okay, objectively the action is wrong mm -hmm. but you as a person are still loved mm -hmm. and that we don't separate that so much in our society today we identify well if i feel this way that's who i am mm -hmm. and we don't understand that no matter what we're loved mm -hmm. no matter how we're feeling that doesn't make everything we do right just mm -hmm. because i feel so angry to murder doesn't make that right mm -hmm. um, the action is still wrong but me as a person made in the image and likeness of God still has value and dignity mm -hmm. and we still belong in the church. We still need to work on our, our actions, mm -hmm. but that we still belong. Mm -hmm. so. And again, that's where St. or not St. but Pope Francis was talking about it being a field hospital. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what we need. Yeah. We can always use another center there. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for Thanks coming for today me. and um, answering our questions. And again, you're uh, practicing right now here in the Valley. Yes. And if you want to give your website, uh, sure. just some information. Uh, Holy Family Therapy, all one word, dot com. Uh, if a person wants to uh, schedule any kind of an appointment with me, they can go there. And um, there's a link that they can request an appointment and that will put us in communication. Uh, my telephone number is 602-615-6921. Uh, they would get me directly, no, uh, nobody else. Um, I'm also working at a, a wonderful Catholic um, practice in town in Mesa called uh, Journey to Peace Counseling Services. Uh, and you can find that at Journey to Peace uh, online as well. So lots of options out there. And awesome. those numbers of Catholic therapists in the Valley is growing. Uh, yes. It's a wonderful need, and um, we're there to help. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome.